All right, uh, these cameras have been acting funny on me recently, they're cutting me off a lot. So I think we're going to try to split today's lecture up into three lectures. Lectures A, B, and C. Try to keep them to about uh, 22, 23 minutes each. Watch for that clock there. Uh, in lecture A, we're going to review another example of this actuarial present value and show you what you need to do to help you finish the homework assignment. If you're still feeling stuck on it, again, it's due by 4 o'clock today. Um, lecture B, we're going to do some stuff on Mathematica with that. And lecture C, I'm going to do a normal curve problem or two, uh, because I'll assign a couple problems about that, and introduce chapter 9 with introduction to sequences. All right, so what's the example that we're going to do here in lecture A? It's going to be the other example that was in the notebook <coughs> that I showed you last time, that we didn't have time to go over. Um, again, I'm not going to go through every calculation in detail here. What's really more important for you is to understand the big picture of things, so that you can then go ahead and put the pieces together. So you, you, we've got two random variables going on, okay? We've got capital T, which represents the lifetime of our washing machine, all right? In the symbolism that I used in the other problem, there was this omega that was the you know, drop dead date. They, the washing machine had to die by age 20, according to those models and according to your model on your homework. But according to the exponential lead distribu uh, distribution, the, well, the washing machine could at last an arbitrarily long amount of time, although it would be unlikely for it to last past a certain amount of time. The PDF in such a situation is an exponential decay function right there, lambda times e to the negative lambda t. That's something where if you integrate it from 0 to infinity, you get 1. The CDF, the cumulative distribution function, is found by integrating this. And then again, we can start at 0 instead of minus infinity since all of our variables can't be negative. You get this function, 1 minus e to the negative lambda t. So the two graphs look like this. Uh, the exponential decay, that's the distribution of the PDF itself. It's got a vertical intercept of lambda. This is the graph. F of t equals lambda e to the negative lambda t. That's the thing you integrate to find probabilities. And then you've got the cumulative distribution function. Again, this function right here, 1 minus e to the negative lambda t. Um, that goes up like this and has a limiting value of 1 as t goes to infinity. That's capital F of t, 1 minus t to the negative lambda t. You calculate differences of that to find probabilities. So for example, if you want to find the probability that the uh, washing machine lasts between uh, 14 and 17 years, You integrate the PDF, but that means you calculate a difference of the CDF, F, capital F of 17 minus capital F of 14. So if you've got a formula for the CDF, you don't have to do an integral anymore. You can just use this formula as is to find a probability. Okay, that's probabilities with respect to the lifetime. You can also calculate the mean. It's 1 over lambda. So if the mean lifetime of the washing machine was 10 years, lambda would be 1 tenth. Right? If you plug in, um, lambda equals 1 tenth right there. 1 over 1 tenth is 10. That would be what lambda would be when the mean is 10 years. And that's what I actually assume down here further. And you can calculate the median as well. Here's where I say lambda is ultimately going to be 0.1 if the mean of lifetime is 10 years. But again, according to the exponential model, the, the washing machine could last arbitrarily long in theory, even though it would not be likely. More importantly, though, we're after the actuarial present value idea. Here's the key equation. We're creating a new random variable. We call it z, because actuaries do. Actuaries call it z. Um, it's representing the present value of a $1,000 future payment, right? It's a warranty. You're saying, if this washing machine dies, we will pay you $1,000. What's the goal in all this? The goal, really, if we can find the mean of this variable, 
then that would give you an idea of what kind of money you should charge the customer for the warranty. I think we found we mean to be 600 something. So you'd want, well that was with the other example, I'm not sure what it is with this one. If the mean was say 650, you'd want to charge them at least $650 for that future $1,000 payment if you're going to break even as an insurance company. Of course, you want to do more than break even, you want to make a profit. So you charge them some amount extra beyond that. And it's based on assumptions, it's based on assumptions of interest rates, we're going to assume a 5% interest rate, compounding continuously. It's a, Assuming your, your model for the lifetime of T is accurate. Okay, those are all assumptions that go into what we're doing. They may or may not be accurate, but we're pretending they are. Just for the sake of getting answers here. Notice the form of this formula. 1,000 e to the negative 0.05 T. The $1,000 is the, the payment in the future. At some unknown time, capital T, yeah, capital T could be 5, it could be 10, it could be 20. Whatever it is, whatever time the washing machine dies, we're pulling that back in time to the present. Multiplying $1,000 by this quantity is going to give you the present value. And the bigger capital T is, the longer the washing machine lasts, the smaller this quantity is going to be. Does that make sense? The bigger this is, the smaller e to that negative power will be and the smaller this $1,000 times that will be. Amounts that are further in the future, $1,000 amount fewer, further in the future, comes back to a present value that's smaller. You can invest less in the present to build up to that in the future. Does that make sense? That should make intuitive sense, I hope. We're interested in this new variable Z. What is its distribution? What's its PDF? What's its CDF? How can you find probabilities related to it? Those functions can help you. And what's its mean, what's its median? And the mean is really the most important thing because the mean as an arithmetic average then informs you as an insurance company, again, what you should charge your customers. So this is real practical. It may not be accurate, it depends on the model's accuracy, but it's a real practical point of view for how to decide what to set your rates at. That's the basic setup, okay? Then come the calculations, and the calculations are pretty nasty, and that's why you said you can use Mathematica whenever you need to. In, in both of your problems, what I have written here, up to this point right there, is the same. Z is going to be this new present value variable present value of that $1,000 future payment. It's a random variable. We don't know what it's going to be because we don't know how long any particular customer's washing machine is going to last. I want to know information about the variable Z. I want to know its CDF. And it turns out the CDF is easier to find than the PDF. CDFs are always probabilities of your variable being less than or equal to something. That's what CDFs always are. Okay? I said that from the very beginning when we first started talking about CDFs. Probability in this case that your variable is less than or equal to a given number in little z. So if little z is a given number, what is the probability of your variable that's the random variable that you don't know what it's going to be for a particular customer will be less than that given number. You do some algebra, replace z with what it equals in terms of t, and the idea is maybe we can use the distribution of t to figure out the distribution of z. And in fact, we can. We do some algebra. To get from here to here, you divide both sides by 1,000. You see that OK? It's coming in. To get from here to here, take the natural log of both sides. Natural log is an increasing function, so if you do that, the inequality does not change direction. So we get this. We're trying to solve for t so that we can use the CDF for t. Divide both sides by negative 0 0.05. Multiply both sides by negative 20. Really. 1 divided by negative 0 0.05 is negative 20. But since that's a negative number, the inequality switches direction. But 
then based on the fact that the probability of an event is 1 minus the probability of the opposite event, I can actually switch the inequality back the other direction as long as I put a 1 minus in there. I didn't write it on the Mathematica thing, but I could have written 1 minus the probability that t is less than or equal to negative 20 natural log of z over 1,000. And again, the less than or equal to versus a strict less than is technically the opposite of that. It's not a big deal here because the variable is continuous. It doesn't matter whether you're focused on an individual value or not. Capital up, that's the CDF for T. Because we're looking at a probability related to T's. You plug this thing right there into the CDF for T. That's the capital F right there. We can use the formula for capital F to find the core formula for capital G. <coughs> that's really cool, I think. I mean, it's a difficult concept. Algebra is a little tricky. But it's really cool that you can use the distribution for T and this formula to ultimately figure out the distribution for Z. Mm -hmm. So I'm confused. So when you do a when you have P T is greater than or equal, mm -hmm. why then do you switch it to one minus F and not one minus P? One and, and then not one minus what? Um, yeah, P? The, one minus F out in front instead of P. It goes from right. P to F. So it's the notation that's confusing. P stands for probability. Yeah. F stands for a function name. F is defined by a probability. Go back up here. F is this integral, capital F, but that integral gives you a probability. That integral gives you the probability that t is between 0 and okay, low Okay, so the probability is equal to that function. Yep. Gotcha. Yep, gotcha. exactly. So yeah, that's, confu that's confusing. I'm glad you brought that up. Capital F is the CDF for t. It is a probability. We can replace this entire thing with capital F of that plugin. Because capital F of t is the probability that capital T is less than equal to little t. So this entire expression, negative 20 natural log of z over 1,000, is playing the role of little t. I can plug it into the fun function for f. And again, for both your problems, up to this point, it's exactly the same. You do the exact same thing. Now it becomes different because your formula for capital F is different. In this example, the formula for capital F is, ah, stop it, is this thing. In the example we did last time, the formula for capital F was, where is it, where is it, this thing, t over omega, which was t over 20. Mm -hmm. Is it 1 minus it because we're doing like the opposite? Exactly, yep. Because of the fact that this is a less than, uh, this is a greater than or equal to sign there, but in a CDF you have a less than or equal to sign. That's why you do one minus. Now it becomes different. What's the formula for capital F again? It's, it's this. Replace the t up there in the exponent of the e with this expression, negative 20 natural log of z over 1,000. That's what I did there. And I also did 1 minus, so the 1's cancel. <coughs> the 1 minus went away because there was a 1 there that canceled with it. The negative signs went away because two negatives, 1 there and 1 there, make a positive. I get this, I can simplify that using properties of logs to that. That's kind of cool, that's kind of simple. That's nice. Z over a thousand squared. Your answers aren't quite so nice for your properties. They involve natural logs and stuff, it's just it's not real pleasant. But you can use Mathematica to, to find it. You can type in your formula for these functions and you can plug things in. Little g, the PDF, is the derivative of capital G. You've got to differentiate your function, your capital G, to find little g. Again, your capital G is complicated, involves logarithms, I think, in both problems. 
you have to choose the chain rule to differentiate it. It's not quite as nice as this. Okay? Once you've got these, you can plot little g. That's the PDF. In this example, it looks straight. How about that? This example is pretty nice. That's the, that's the PDF for g, meaning that it's the PDF for z, little g, meaning since it's higher over here toward 1,000 than toward 0, you should expect for an arbitrarily chosen customer, most likely the present value of your future benefit payment is going to be fairly high. It's going to be much more likely to be higher than 500 than to be less than 500, meaning their washing machine is much more likely to die, to go kaput, in earlier times where the present value is high than in later times where the present value of your benefit payment is going to be lower because it's so far in the future. That's the mean. That's kind of cool. You can find probabilities by just doing differences for capital G. And you can use Mathematica. Again, your formula is going to be kind of nasty. Use Mathematica to do that. By the way, again, natural log of Mathematica is actually L-O-G. Don't forget that when you do your problems. How do you find the mean? You integrate Z times the PDF. In this problem, it turns out fairly easy. In yours, it's more complicated. You can use Mathematica to do your integral. Just make sure you write down for the grader what integral you did. Okay, so you'll have a G. You can use the integral symbol to actually do the integral. Careful, my domain for this one is 0 to infinity. Your domain for your two problems is 1,000 over E to 1,000. One thousand over e is around three hundred and sixty-eight, I think. On your problems, that'll be the domain. Is that like an arbitrary number? Can you get that from somewhere? I got it from somewhere. I got it from some the fact that for your problem, twenty years is the drop dead date for both the linear increasing uh, graph and the linear decreasing graph for the PDF of t. It die, must die by twenty years. And 1,000 over e is the same as 1,000 e to the negative 0 0.05 times 20. That's the same as 1,000 over e, and that's where that comes from. So t can't be bigger than 20, and therefore z can't be smaller than the present value of $1,000 20 years from now. Pull it back, get that, and it's around 368. Running a lot of time here. Let me wrap things up for lecture A. Again, you can use Mathematica to do the integral. For the median, you set capital G of z equal to a half and solve for z. That's an algebra equation. You can use solve to help you solve it. You can look up solve and find examples in the help menu under documentation. Just look up solve and you'll find examples of how to use solve. Examples down there. Okay. Went to the help menu documentation center to find that. Solve is what you would use to solve an algebra equation. Your equations can be solved by hand, they're just kind of a pain. They involve logarithms, you've got to exponentiate, things like that. Okay? Um, I think I'll wrap up lecture A here. In lecture B, which we'll start in just a minute. Uh, we will do the same thing for another example where I'm just going to focus on mathematical usage. So in lecture A, I focused on the mathematical ideas. In lecture B, we're going to focus on mathematical usage. Let's end with lecture A.